In 1991 Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Glenda Cleveland is at home watching the news when she hears her neighbor Jeffrey Dahmer, using power tools just next door. Jeff goes to his sink to clean his red tools. He leaves his apartment and in the hallway, Glenda complains about the smell coming from his apartment. Jeff lies, and tells her his meat went bad. Glenda is annoyed because he threw out a bunch of meat just the other day. Jeff lies again, and tells her that the smell must be his dead fish. As he walks closer to Glenda, Glenda is visibly afraid of him. Eventually Jeff leaves the building. There's a bunch of missing poster signs of black men near a gay club called Club 219. At the club, he meets with acquaintances, including Tracy Edwards. He dances with Tracy and dances the night away. Then he asks the men if any of them want to model for him for $50. Tracy is the only one out of the three that agrees to this. Tracy and Jeff leave the club and go to his apartment. Tracy is hesitant at first, but eventually goes inside. He immediately notices the bad smell in Jeff's apartment. The camera pans to a drill with some blood on it. Then Jeff locks the door. Jeff grabs a beer, and we see a man's head on the bottom of the fridge. He pours a drink for Tracy. Tracy notices his drink is very bubbly and is suspicious of it, and only takes a sip. He wants to leave, but Jeff tells him not to leave. He even blocks the door to keep him from leaving. Tracy acts calmly the entire time, until suddenly Jeff puts him in handcuffs. Tracy calls for help, then Jeff tackles him down then threatens him with a machete. Meanwhile, Glenda can hear the muffled conversation next door. Jeff threatens Tracy to go into the bedroom. Tracy sits on the bed, while Jeff turns on a movie. Tracy asks what the barrel in the corner is for. Tracy is afraid so he tries to leave, but Jeff stops him. Tracy sees the blood on the mattress and is afraid for his life. For survival, Tracy calms himself down, and tries to seduce Jeff. It only works a little before Jeff gets suspicious. By this time, Jeff expects Tracy to be fully drugged, but Tracy only took a small sip of his drink, so Tracy is fully awake. Tracy tells Jeff that he should take photos of him. Using his dance moves to seduce him. Jeff then goes to the other room to grab the camera. Just as Tracy is about to rush to leave, Jeff is already back with the camera. Jeff takes a couple of photos then tells Tracy that they need to go back in the room to watch the movie. Tracy is very scared. Jeff moves closer to Tracy to listen to his heartbeat. He tells Tracy that he's going to eat his heart. Eventually, Tracy is able to smash Jeff's head with a lampshade and tries to escape. He has trouble with the locked door and Jeff is able to catch him. Luckily Tracy is able to hit him again then finally escapes, screaming for help. Glenda looks out the hallway and sees Jeff, but immediately goes back inside. Tracy runs outside screaming for help while Jeff nonchalantly goes back into his apartment. Cops finally find Tracy in the alleyway, but they're a bit suspicious of him, especially since he has handcuffs on. The two cops approach Tracy readying their guns at their holsters, and Tracy tries to explain the situation. The two cops, along with Tracy, go to Jeff's apartment. Jeff tries to lie his way out of it. The cops ask for the keys to the handcuffs and asks if they can go into the apartment. Jeff surprisingly lets them in, and the cops are immediately repulsed by the smell. One of the cops goes into his bedroom to look for the keys and notices the blood on the mattress, and the large barrel. Jeff tries to go into the dresser where the handcuff keys are, but the cop decides to do it. He finds the key, but also finds photos of dead men. Jeff tries to escape, but the cops arrest him. Tracy is relieved. Jeff whispers for the things he's done, he should be dead. The neighbors all gather to watch Jeff get arrested. Glenda yells at the cops, saying she kept calling them and the cops never did anything about Jeff. She wonders what the cops found in his apartment. Jeff's father Lionel, goes to the police station, and the police have to give him the bad news. Lionel admits that his son was always a strange boy. He mentioned the divorce negatively affecting Jeff when he was just 18. Lionel thinks Jeff's hernia operation may have caused brain damage. Lionel assumes Jeff only attempted to kill Tracy. The cops tell him that Jeff committed multiple murders. They tell him there was a human head in the refrigerator. Two plastic bags in the freezer containing a human heart, one that has male genitalia. In the bedroom, there were five skulls, knives, hammers, Polaroids documenting everything. And a 57-gallon barrel filled with acid. Inside were three torsos and other body parts. They also tell him that Jeffrey ate some of his victims. The cops leave Lionel and he immediately cries. Meanwhile, Glenda snoozes as the news reports about Dahmer. She sees a ton of people flocking around the apartment building. Then cops tell everyone at the apartment complex that they need to leave because the entire building is a crime scene. 
news reporters are covering Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes. All victims were men. The news even wonders how Jeff was able to keep committing these crimes when he was a convicted child sex offender. Meanwhile, Jeff is booked and sits with detectives to tell them all of his crimes. They wonder why Jeff committed all the crimes and wonder why he kept the body parts. In 1966, a young Jeffrey Dahmer rides the bus home. His baby brother David, is crying at home while his mom Joyce, is laying in bed almost dead. She tried to unalive herself but luckily Jeff called the ambulance. Lionel comes home and says Joyce is just doing it for attention. Later, Joyce and Lionel fight because Lionel is never home. Lionel criticizes Joyce for constantly being on medication. Jeff gives his teacher a jar of tadpoles as a gift. One of the kids, Kevin, gets the jar of tadpoles from the teacher. Then later Jeff screams at Kevin for taking the jar from the teacher. After school, Jeff follows Kevin home and steals the jar. He decides to pour motor oil into the jar and watches the tadpoles slowly dying. One afternoon, Lionel finds a dead opossum under their house. Jeff is very curious about the dead animal. Eventually, Jeff gets so serious he wants to get into taxidermy, so his dad shows him the ropes. They go around looking for roadkill to dissect. They play with the raccoon's intestine and heart. Sometime in 1981, in Miami, Jeff works at a deli cutting meat. We find out that Jeff was discharged from the army. His dad allows Jeff to move back home. His dad picks him up at the airport, and tells him he's going to stay with his grandma but he must abide by her rules and must get a job. At dinner, his grandma tries to get Jeff to meet girls and tries to get him out of the house to socialize. The next day, Jeff has a job at a butcher's shop. He has to go shopping for a dress shirt for work. And while paying, he notices a muscular male mannequin. Instead of leaving the store, he goes to the dressing room to hide. Once everyone has left for the night, he packs up the mannequin to steal and brings it home. He undresses and puts the mannequin on the bed while talking to it, and starts to touch the mannequin inappropriately. The next day, he asks his grandma to not go into his room and leave his laundry just outside. Of course his grandma is super curious now, and is creeped out when she sees the mannequin. The movie then transitions to 1991, when Jeffrey Dahmer ended one of his victims who is now laying in bed. Later that night, Jeff sees a bunch of kids and charms one of them named, Connerake. He tells Connerake that he'll pay him good money to model. At his apartment, Connerake drinks some beer that Jeff gives him. Connerake admits that he's only 14 years old. Then Connerake reveals that he's Somsack's brother, the underage boy that Jeff Dahmer got arrested for touching. Jeff is upset about this. He then tells Connerake to keep drinking and persuades him to chug his drink down. Once drugged out, Jeff takes photos. Connerake tries to get away but is unable to. Connerake's eyes are all white now. Then Jeff goes to grab the power drill. Connerake is still somewhat awake, but is unable to move. Eventually Connerake is able to get up and he slowly moves to leave the apartment. In the hallway, two girls see Connerake and wonder what's going on. Later, Jeff comes back to the apartment building to see Connerake with Glenda, the two girls and two cops. Jeff lies and says Connerake is his boyfriend, but Glenda doesn't believe him because Connerake looks way too young. The two teenage girls try to tell the cops that the boy is bleeding. Jeff lies again and tells them his boyfriend fell, and is always drunk. The cops try to ask the kid how old he is. And Jeff tries to reassure them that Connerake is 19 years old. The cops agree to bring Connerake and Jeff back into the apartment. Glenda tries to argue with them but they don't listen to her. At the apartment, the cops wonder if Jeff has anything weird in the apartment. The cops are afraid that they might catch AIDS, so they're not really into searching the apartment. The cops briefly peek into the room where a dead black man lay on the floor. The cops leave and tells Jeff to take care. One of the cops says they gotta go home to take a shower now, afraid that they might have caught something. Jeff then closes the door and finishes the job. Meanwhile, Glenda is shocked the police just left and she hears loud music and power tools coming from next door. On May 27, 1991, we hear Glenda's actual police call. She wonders what happened with Connerake, and if they confirmed his actual age. The police informs her that Connerake is an adult and Jeff's boyfriend. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1959, Jeffrey's mom takes pills for anxiety while she's pregnant with Jeff. While driving home, Lionel Dahmer sees Joyce at a bus stop looking dazed. The next day, they go to meet with the doctor and Lionel doesn't shy away from naming all the pills she's on, like Valium, morphine and overusing her anti-anxiety medication. Joyce just wants to know what is going on, but the doctor tells her to just enjoy the pregnancy and relax. 
She wasn't diagnosed back then, but today's standard, this would be called perinatal depression, and Joyce even experiences postpartum psychosis later. In 1977, Jeff and Lionel go fishing. While Jeff learns how to put a worm on a hook, Lionel wonders if Jeff talks about girls with his buddies, but Jeff doesn't say anything. Later, Lionel teaches Jeff how to clean a fish. As Jeff guts the fish, he becomes mesmerized by the guts. The show transitions into Jeff trying to finish himself using some Playboy magazines. He is having trouble, then gets interrupted by Joyce and Lionel arguing. Jeff goes to see what is going on, Joyce is talking about how she was following UFOs. Then Lionel screams at her. Jeff goes back to his room and grabs his lotion to try once again. This time he used the visualization of the fish guts to get off, and it works. The next day at school, the popular jock Chaz, asks him to do the impersonation. Jeff mimics a mentally challenged person he knows, and Chaz says that's what they call doing the Dahmer. Jeff starts to do the impersonation again, and he doesn't know that he's being teased. In science class, they're about to dissect a baby pig. A vegetarian girl in class protests and Jeff tells her to shut up. Chaz likes that Jeff told her to shut up. During the dissection, Jeff immediately takes the heart out. After class, Jeff asks the teacher if he can take an extra pig home to practice. In the hallway, Chaz thanks Jeff for shutting up the vegetarian. Jeff has a small crush on Chaz, so he asks Chaz to come over to his house to dissect the extra pig he got, but Chaz rudely says no. Subsequently, Lionel and Joyce are finalizing their divorce. Joyce wins custody of her two sons, David and Jeff. Joyce grabs David but doesn't want anything to do with Jeff. When Joyce finally moves out, she tells Jeff he never liked her. She tells him it's sick that they cut up roadkill in the garage. Then she drives off with her other son David in the car. Jeff ends up living alone for the time being, and his dad is absent since he's with a new woman. Later, Jeff drives his car around and sees a hot guy running. This inspires him to start working out more so he can look attractive. Jeff starts to drink a lot in his social isolation. He starts to get a bit manic as he talks to himself and dance. He even continues dissecting roadkill alone. Eventually he grabs a bat and waits for the jogger to come by his regular route. As the jogger approaches, Jeff gets ready to hit him, but doesn't follow through. He invites the jogger home for a beer. Jeff vents to him about his situation. His mom has been gone for three months and his dad hasn't been around. But Jeff is happy that the jogger is here now. Fortunately, the jogger isn't really there, and Jeff was daydreaming about it. The jogger actually ran away when Jeff was about to pummel him with a bat. Meanwhile, we find out Joyce has been working to help women. She will be taking over the clinic to manage it. At school, Jeff is late to class and drinks a beer. He is sent to the school counselor to figure out what's going on, and she tries to nudge him into a career path. But Jeff feels hopeless. Later, Jeff finds a shirtless hitchhiker on the road. He is headed to a concert and meeting up with buddies at night, but needs to hitch a ride. Jeff says to come home with him to drink a few beers before he drops him off to the concert. The hitchhiker Stephen agrees to this. Back at his house, the two work out, smoke and drink. Steve then says they think they should start heading to the concert, since it takes a while to get there. Jeff is persistent on staying at the house a bit longer. Then Jeff goes in for a kiss but Stephen retracts a bit, and tells Jeff he doesn't swing that way. Stephen has had enough and demands Jeff to bring him to the concert now. Jeff then says he doesn't want Stephen to go, and starts to cry. Stephen calls Jeff the F word to describe a bundle of sticks, then leaves. However, Jeff is angry and hits Stephen with a dumbbell. Steve is still alive as he struggles to hurt Jeff. Jeff chokes him to death, then kisses him. Stupidly, Jeff thinks Stephen is joking around, and Jeff demands him to wake up. Eventually Jeff realizes what he did and calls himself an idiot. Jeff drags the body out the house, and puts him under the house where he and his father found the dead opossum. Later, Jeff becomes paranoid since this is his first time killing. He goes back to the body and drags it out. He brings the body into the shed where he lays it down, then touches Stephen's chest. He then uses an electric knife to cut the body into pieces. Once that's done, he drives out with the body pieces in his car. Because he's swerving, police pull him over. The cop tells Jeff that they can smell alcohol. They ask him what's in the garbage bags, and Jeff lies saying it's grass clippings. Surprisingly the cops just give Jeff a warning, and tells him to go home. So Jeff ends up having to flush the body parts down the toilet, and bakes them until they're just bones, then he breaks the bones into pieces. On his roof, he throws the pulverized bones into the air. The show then transitions to 1991 in Bath, Ohio, 
the FBI are investigating the same property where Stephen was killed. Investigators asked Jeff why he scattered all the bones around. Jeff said it's because he wanted Stephen to still be around, surrounding him. Jeff believes he was born messed up and doesn't believe it was his upbringing. A psychiatrist was able to deduce that cutting up victims was sexually arousing for Jeff. Jeff liked the way the organs looked and liked the shine to them. The psychiatrist says Jeff has splanchnophilia, when someone finds internal organs arousing. The investigators wonder why there was a gap between Dahmer's first kill and second kill. Dahmer says he was trying to be a good boy. In 1978, Dahmer inserts himself into a yearbook photo for the Honor Society, even though he only has a 2.0 GPA. Regardless of this, Jeff finds his face blacked out in his yearbook. Lionel and his new girl Sherry, are on their way to Jeffrey's house, thinking Joyce still lives there. They find Jeff all alone in a messy house. Jeff meets Sherry for the first time, and Lionel finds out that Joyce left Jeff all alone for three months. Later at a diner, Lionel tries to figure out what's next for Jeff's life since he just graduated. Jeff almost spills the beans about what he did to Stephen. Lionel wonders if it's about sex stuff and Lionel interjects before Jeff can spill the beans. At this time, he probably suspects Jeff is gay, but doesn't want to hear it. Lionel says Jeff can go to Ohio State for his continued education. At Ohio State, Jeff is more awkward than ever. He socially isolates even though a young man looks at him in a peculiar way. Turns out, Jeff hasn't been going to class, and the dean has to talk to Lionel about Jeff's GPA being a 0.45, so he has to be expelled. Lionel is upset since they've been spending a lot of money for him to attend school. Lionel makes him enlist in the army. In the army, he learns about sleeping pills called Halcyon. He steals this from the pharmacy, and pulverizes it to drug a guy. In his barracks, while the guy is fast asleep, Jeff caresses the man's ears before he takes advantage of him. He doesn't last long in the army because in 1981, Jeff is honorably discharged. So then Jeff is sent to live with his grandma to help her. At his grandma's, Jeff finds a box of Lionel's photos. While looking through the photos, his grandma tells him he should stop drinking and they need to find him a nice girl at church. Jeff gets a job at a butcher's shop where he gets to see organs all day long. On the previous episode, Jeff got a male mannequin and brought it home to sleep with. His grandma finds it while Jeff is out at work. Once Jeff comes home, he's upset that his mannequin is missing. His grandma is upset that he even had it in the first place. His grandma tells him that if he's gay, they can go to church to help convert him and work through it. Jeff screams at her asking for his mannequin back. She tells him that she threw the mannequin away and Jeff throws another fit. Later at dinner, Jeff apologizes and denies that he's gay. He said the mannequin was just a friend. Later, Jeff goes to the state fair where he gets himself drunk. Beside one of the games, there's a strong man mannequin. Jeff imagines it as Stephen and then he strokes himself to completion. He's booked for public indecency and is fired by his employer who found out about what happened. Jeff applies for a new job as a phlebotomist. He extracts people's blood for donation. His grandma is proud of him, however she doesn't know that he's been stealing the blood. He lays three of them on his bed, then goes to the bathroom to drink it. Later in 1987 at Club 219, he meets a white guy named Charles. They end up at a bathhouse and enter a private room. Charles wants to get it on, but Jeff just wants to lay down in the bed to hold him. The movie flashes between the mannequin and what he's doing to Charles. Eventually Charles leaves the next day. This sparks Jeff's gay club scene days, and he starts to bring more men to the bathhouse. He crushes pills at the bar then puts the drugs into a drink. Eventually, the owner of the bathhouse catches on when one of Jeff's victims is unresponsive. Luckily, EMT is able to revive him. When Jeff returns, the owner warns the new guy about Jeff, and tells Jeff he's been blacklisted by all the bathhouses in town. The next Sunday, his grandma tries to get Jeff to go to church with her since Jeff just got fired. He says he doesn't believe in God. Later, at the club, he spots a white guy and they start dancing together. They go to a fancy hotel and Jeff does his regular routine with drugging the drinks. Jeff realizes he gave the wrong drink and accidentally drank the drugged one. He has trouble staying conscious while he puts drugs into another drink. Eventually, the guy drinks it and the movie transitions into the next day with Jeff waking up to the guy laying in bed, but the guy is badly bruised, he'd not been dead. Jeff tries to perform CPR on him but the guy doesn't wake up. Jeff goes out and buys a suitcase. Then he stuffs the man into the suitcase. While his grandma goes out for the day, Jeff brings the suitcase into the basement. Eventually he grabs a meat cleaver to do his thing. 
he preserves the head in saran wrap then kisses it. He places it into the same box that had his dad's photos, a sort of memorabilia that he likes to keep. In 1987 Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Jeff lives with his grandma. He currently works at a chocolate factory. While at work, he sees an obituary of a recently deceased young man. So he decides to dig up his grave, so he can lay with him. He tells investigators that he didn't actually follow through with it because the ground was too hard. The investigators question him some more in 1991, after Dahmer was caught. He tells them that he wanted to control these men that he hunted because everyone in his life always wanted to control him. Jeff admits that the hitchhiker he killed was accidental. And the white guy he killed at the hotel was also an accident. They ask what changed because after those two deaths, the killings were no longer accidental. Jeff admits that his overdrinking got out of hand. He describes the times when he would bring men over back to his grandma's house and how he would drug them. Then he would take them downstairs in the fruit cellar and strangle them so they wouldn't suffer. He recounts killing three men at his grandma's house. He admits that he targeted men who he thought were beautiful. The black investigator doesn't buy this and tells Jeff that Jeff purposefully got an apartment in the black community to target them because it was unpatrolled. Jeff denies this and says it was all he could afford. Then Jeff continues his stories about his grandma. She hated going down into the fruit cellar until she started noticing the smell downstairs. Jeff would triple bag the body parts so the smell wouldn't be so bad. He experimented on the bodies by cutting them, hammering it and boiling it until the meat came off. Jeff says his grandma was suspicious of something but never thought he would be a killer. She would go downstairs to see all the men Jeff would bring home, but she didn't want to know too much about Jeff's lifestyle, so she would go back upstairs. The smell in the cellar got so bad in July and August because of the humidity, but Jeff continues to lie about it, saying it's his taxidermy stuff. Jeff thinks his grandma was deliberately not trying to see who Jeff really was. One time, his dad pays a visit and wants Jeff to unlock the door in the cellar. His dad is suspicious of the large saw Jeff uses to chop up roadkill. His dad goes to inspect the drain and he's repulsed by the smell. Jeff lies and says it must have been a skunk. After this, Jeff stops killing people for a while. He mentions this one time he really screwed up. A black man, Ron, has trouble starting up his car. So Jeff offers to get his car at his grandma's house to help start up Ron's car. Ron is hesitant at first but finally agrees to go with him. At the house, Jeff asks Ron if he wants to see the fruit seller. Ron just wants to go get his car started and doesn't want a beer, even after Jeff insists. Jeff gives him a coffee that Ron accepts. Meanwhile, Jeff's grandma wakes up after hearing the commotion. Ron drinks the drugged up coffee and his grandma asks if someone is down there. Ron tells Jeff that nothing is happening between them and eventually gets up to leave, but it's too late. Ron is terrified as he realizes that he's been drugged. During all of this, Jeff's grandma keeps calling for him and Jeff is annoyed. Eventually his grandma comes downstairs to see the commotion. She's worried about Ron and tells Jeff they need to take him to the hospital. Grandma is worried and wants to call Jeff's dad, but Jeff blocks her. His grandma realizes something isn't right, so she decides to stay with Ron throughout the night. Jeff hits the wall and screams at his grandma. He then says if she's so worried, she should call an ambulance but he knows exactly why she isn't doing so. The next morning, Ron wakes up to Dahmer and his grandma. They drop off a drugged up Ron inside a bus. At the bus last stop, the driver wakes up Ron who is forced to leave. Ron aimlessly walks into a cornfield. Eventually he ends up in a hospital and a nurse tells him he OD'd. Ron admits he doesn't do drugs and tells the nurse that he was drugged on purpose. He talks to a detective he paints the picture clearly about Jeff drugging people. He even heard about Jeff's reputation at the bathhouses. Eventually, the detective pays Jeff and his grandma a visit. Jeff lies about Ron and said that Ron was really drunk and was only helping Ron sober up. The detective wonders if Jeff took Ron's bracelet and Jeff lies about it. The bracelet is shown to be on someone else's cut up hand. His grandma says she was with Jeff the entire time so he couldn't have stolen Ron's bracelet. Back at the precinct, the detective tells Ron that there's two sides of the story, and he believes Jeff and his grandma. Ron is annoyed because the detective took Jeff's word who has a criminal record over Ron's word who doesn't have a criminal record. 
Ron reiterates that Jeff tried to kill him, and he's furious that they chose to believe a white man over a black man. One night when Ron is walking down the street, he sees a random guy going into a cab with Jeff. He warns the guy about Jeff, and the random guy decides not to get in. Jeff breathes deeply as he stares at Ron furiously. Jeff decides to walk away though. One night, a young, drugged-up Asian kid leaves Jeff's house. Jeff's grandma hears all of this, and luckily ushers Jeff to go back inside. The Asian boy arrives at home and his parents are furious with him, but then realize something isn't right. The next day at the chocolate factory, police arrest Jeff. During his court hearing, the judge seems sympathetic about Jeff's alcohol problem because Jeff reminds him of his grandson. He gives Dahmer a second chance by hiding his misconduct from his employer and allowing Jeff to avoid a correctional facility. The family of the young boy look heartbroken. Lionel tells Jeff that they're going to have one last dinner as a family before Jeff goes to jail. At dinner, Jeff lies and says it was a setup. He didn't try to sexually assault the 13-year-old boy, and he was just doing photography. His grandma leaves the room disturbed, especially since she paid for his $2,500 bail. Jeff and Lionel argue over a box that Jeff refuses to give back. The box was used to hide decapitated heads at one point. Lionel leaves the room to grab something to break the box, but then Jeff willingly gives him the keys. Turns out Jeff removed the decapitated head and replaced it with Playboy magazines. On his car ride home, Lionel begins to blame himself about Jeff's character. He admits that Jeff has made him uncomfortable. Lionel thinks about all the red flags he should have seen, like Jeff being discharged, the mannequin they found in his bed, and Jeff exposing himself at the state fair. The film transitions into the court proceeding again as Lionel explains how the Asian dad's face broke him. During his testimony, Mr. Synthesome phone gives a heartbreaking testimony in English, however, the judge seems annoyed at his broken English. A then after one of the kids translates, the judge looks even more annoyed. Then the film transitions into Lionel's letter he wrote to the judge asking for grace and mercy for his alcoholic son. We know that the judge actually took this letter to heart. A year passes, and Lionel picks up his son from jail. Lionel tells him he must find an apartment to live in on his own. Lionel wonders if there was a rehabilitation program for him, but Jeff says no because people just left him alone. Lionel looks worried since he assumed the center would give his son a way to get better. Eventually we see Jeff's new apartment, and he shows it to a deaf man named Tony Hughes. Episode 6 focuses on Tony Hughes' story, and it's done mostly in sign language. Shirley gives birth to Tony, and everyone is in love with him. Later, Shirley finds out that the gentamicin antibiotics that her son was given when he had pneumonia caused Tony to lose his hearing. In 1991, Tony is still able to enjoy the music at a gay dance club. A man initiates dancing with him, but as soon as the man finds out that Tony is deaf, the man is immediately not interested. During the episode, we hear what it's like to be in Tony's shoes, all the ambient noise is gone. It's mostly silent with the sound of dead air. He hangs out with his friends, and they all discuss what it's like to try to find a decent guy as a deaf person. Tony says he's worth a lot, so he's not just going to settle with anyone. Tony says he wants to break into the modeling business, and won't let him being deaf keep him down. Later, his family wonders how Tony is doing at his new job. Eventually he gets terrible news about his friend Rico, being murdered. His mom tries to comfort Tony but Tony is ready to move out and start a new life in Madison, a college town. Tony struggles to find a new job at Madison because he's deaf. Luckily he finds a retail store where one of the managers knows how to sign, and he immediately gets the job. Tony finds photographers at the college campus to model for. He finds a photographer who is also gay, and they end up flirting. Tony says he's looking for love, but the photographer is only looking for a hookup. At a gay dance club, Tony and his friend are dancing. They notice Jeffrey staring at Tony, so Tony goes over to talk to him. Jeff compliments Tony. The two end up on the dance floor together, and eventually Jeff is just holding on to Tony, listening to his heartbeat. Jeff goes to grab a drink for Tony. He thinks about drugging Tony's drink but then decides not to. Later, Jeff admits to Tony that he likes him a lot. He asks Tony to come home with him but Tony tells Jeff to work for it. Nights pass, and the two get to know each other really well. They even go on dates together, 
and Jeff even learns some basic sign language. Tony says the effort with Jeff seems worth it, and Jeff happily smiles. Jeff has his dad and Sherry come over. They notice that Jeff is doing really well. Jeff said things are turning around for him, and thanks his dad for never giving up on him. Eventually Tony goes home to Jeff's apartment. Jeff thinks about drugging Tony but decides not to. They end up playing a creepy game that Jeff made up when he was a kid. If the pieces get too close to each other, they end up in the vortex and the game is over. Jeff gets a bit frustrated during the game but Tony's sweetheart ends up calming Jeff down. Jeff goes in for a kiss, but Tony says only on the cheek. The next morning, Tony has to leave early for work, and Jeff is sad and frustrated. He goes for the hammer and hides it behind his back. Tony tries to reassure Jeff that they will see each other next week. Tony promises he won't disappear. Before exiting, Tony does a cute dance move. A few days later, Shirley goes to see a cop and report Tony missing. She hasn't seen him for two days, and apparently, Tony never showed up for work. Shirley tries to tell the cop that Tony is a good boy and something is up. The cop asks one more time if Tony has a history of gangs or gun violence. Shirley is put off by this questionnaire and feels like the cop doesn't believe her. Eventually Shirley and Barbara put a missing persons poster up for Tony all around Madison. They take matters in their own hands by having a search party for Tony. Jeff shows up to this and even donates some money. He looks at Shirley, but then walks away. He goes back to his apartment to drink. He sorts through all of his victim's driver's license. He calls Errol Lindsay's sister and tells her that Errol Lindsay is gone and went into the vortex. The movie flashes back to the day Tony disappeared. It turns out he forgot his keys in Jeff's apartment and goes back for it. It is suggested that Jeff goes into the room and attacks Tony. Later that night, Jeff holds onto Tony's hand. The movie does a flashback to when Tony and his mom are having a discussion. Shirley has an inkling feeling that Tony is gay and brings up the AIDS epidemic. She's really supportive of him. They say their last goodbye, back at Doma's apartment. He grabs a piece of meat from the fridge. It is assumed it was part of Tony. He goes to eat it and then breathes heavily in satisfaction. Tracy runs out of the hallway leaving Jeff's apartment. He's screaming for help and Glenda rushes back into her apartment. Glenda calms herself down before going back into the hallway. She stupidly checks Jeff's peephole and a shadow covers it, so she rushes back to call the cops. She notices that the cops are already here anyway with Tracy. It's important to note that the character of Glenda in the series was a little made up because the real life Glenda lived in an apartment building across the street. It was Pam who lived next door to Doma in real life and she wasn't in this series. Glenda sees Jeff being taken away and she is upset because she called the cops about Doma and they did nothing. She wonders what the cops found in the apartment. Nisi Nash as Glenda gives a powerful performance as she yells at the cops saying they came too late. The next day, the apartment complex has become a sideshow. The cops evacuate the tenants including Glenda. She wonders how many bodies they found. Cops were able to find 11 bodies in the apartment, including a 14-year-old Connor Ark. Aimer talks to the police chief and he's upset that two cops allowed the 14-year-old to go back in the apartment with Doma. Two detectives go to all the victims' houses and let them know about their missing family member. All of them are upset. One of them is the Laotian family synthesome phone. Jeff had touched the brother Samsak inappropriately and was sent to prison for it, but soon after Jeff went after his brother Conorak and drilled his head open. Meanwhile, Glenda continues to vent to people how the cops believed the white man Doma over her two nieces. She is reprimanded at work for her statements in the newspaper, and it seems no one is interested in her well-being. Reverend Jackson gets involved with the Dahmer case since Dahmer mostly targeted black and brown men. He says it may not be super obvious, but it is part of their civil rights fight. Society places black and brown men as low value, and police do not do their jobs properly in these underrepresented communities. The mayor and chief of police do not want the reverend involved because there could be riots, but Reverend Jackson won't back down because he wants people to be held accountable. Glenda meets Reverend Jackson. Glenda is pissed off because even the police don't want to hear what she currently has to say. Reporters in Paris, France want to know, but no one in their local area does. She recalls a time when she smelled something bad and goes to Jeff's apartment to confront him about it. Jeff says he just left meat out for too long and it spoiled. A man named Dean is new to the apartment complex and meets Glenda for the first time. 
she gives him the lowdown on how shady the area is. When Dean leaves, she overhears Jeff meet Dean for the first time, and she listens in on their flirty conversation. One night, Glenda sees Jeff throwing things away in the dump. The next day, Jeff invites Dean over to his apartment. Glenda then starts to notice the two are hanging out more. And eventually one night, she hears commotion coming from the next room, so she asks the apartment manager to check in on this. She even calls the police department for help, but yet again, no one listens to her. She eventually notices Dean's mailbox getting fuller by the day, so this motivates her to get the building manager to open Dean's door. She even gets him to smell the vents from Dahmer's room. She asks the manager to evict Dahmer, so he goes to Dahmer's room to try to evict him. Jeff comes into the hallway, all drunk, and is given a 30-day eviction notice. Jeff is furious and knows it's Glenda who made the complaint. The next day, Jeff goes to Glenda's apartment and apologizes. He begs for her to take back the complaint, but she refuses. She stupidly allows Jeff into her apartment and he notices that he doesn't smell anything. He gives her a sandwich loaded with meat to eat. She says she will eat it later, but Jeff insists she eats it now. Jeff says the meat is like a pulled pork. Glenda says there is no way she would eat anything from him, especially since his apartment smells like a dead raccoon's ass. It's important to note that the real Pamela actually did eat Jeff's sandwich that was given to her. Back to this story, Glenda wonders what goes on in his apartment. All the screaming she hears, the smells, and she wonders what happened to the Asian kid, then wonders what happened to Dean. Jeff suggests for her to eat the sandwich again, but Glenda is firm and kicks him out. She's visibly scared as Jeff looks at the door, although he eventually leaves. Glenda gasps for air once he's gone. Another night passes and Glenda notices a new man is with Jeff. She hears screaming and struggling noises once again. She calls the cops and the dispatcher says to check to make sure, but Glenda is shocked at this response. There ain't no way in hell she's gonna check if someone is getting murdered. She also wonders why they don't even ask for the apartment number when the dispatcher says they'll send a cop over. Glenda is over it by now, as she cries desperately for help because she believes someone is being killed. During the night, Glenda lays crying as she hears the sound of a drill coming from Jeff's room. Then she hears what sounds like a skull being cut open and blood splattering everywhere. The Reverend tells Glenda that her voice is going to make a difference in this case, and the cops who let Doma take the 14-year-old boy have now been suspended. Lionel Dahmer cries after learning about what his son has done. He's allowed to see Jeff and hugs him. Lionel admits that Jeff needs professional help and hopes his son can get better. Lionel asks Jeff why he did all of this. Jeff talks about all the times they went out to get roadkill and dissect them. Lionel feels guilty and says that can't be why. Meanwhile, Jeff's mom Joyce is being bombarded by news reporters. She denounces the Dahmer name then goes to work at the HIV clinic. Lionel is up all night and starts to blame Joyce for what happened to Jeff. He says Jeff is the way he is because Joyce was always on pills and was an absent mother. Lionel admits that he sometimes had thoughts like his son. He would make explosives and think about how it would be like to kill someone. Sherry comforts him and says it's not his fault. Eventually the police are at Jeff's grandma's house and it's a full crime scene. Cops are there to recover all the other bodies that are around the property. Reverend Jackson preaches at church about how they will not rest until everyone is held accountable around the Dahmer case. The next day, the cops who gave Connor Rock back to Dahmer are suspended, but basically on paid leave. The chief mentions how the two cops told dispatch that they had to take a shower after being exposed to a gay man's apartment. Since they feared they may have caught AIDS, Lionel shows Jeff that hairs on the cover of Newsweek and People magazine. Unfortunately, Wisconsin doesn't have the death penalty, but they want Jeff to plea insanity. Jeff doesn't want to do any of this because it's not true. They try to convince him about a man named Dead Gein who had committed similar murders before and had plead insanity. A body in Ed's shed was found to be dismembered without a head and upside down. Ed doesn't say anything for 30 hours straight. They found the woman's head, found bowls made out of skulls, and his chairs were upholstered with human skin. They said Ed went into a daze when he committed these acts. Ed spent the rest of his life in a hospital to get the help he needed, and the lawyer says he can do the same thing for Jeff. During the court hearing, the judge rules that Jeff is of sound mind and not insane. After court, Lionel and Joyce get into an argument. Lionel wants Joyce to take some accountability for how Jeff turned out, and Joyce says she's not the one who helped Jeff cut roadkill. Joyce goes to one of the victim's house and apologizes for what Jeff did to Curtis. Joyce wonders if they would say something on behalf of Jeff to help him get into a hospital to treat him rather than prison. The grandmother is like what the F. 
but she says now is the time for Joyce to listen to someone else, truth, and to shut the F up. She didn't say it like that but I know that's what we were all thinking. During the trial, the victims' families give their testimony. The synthosome phone talk about how they were robbed of the American dream when Connor Ark was taken from them. Shirley Hughes reads a poem from one of Tony's friend. The older sister of Errol Lindsay walks in angry and gives a gut-wrenching testimony, then has to be held back by others as she threatens to kill Jeffrey. Jeff reads his letter in front of everyone and admits that he wishes to be dead. He committed those acts not out of hate for anyone, but because he's sick. He apologizes for everything he's done, and the best he can do right now is try to identify the remains. The camera pans to Lionel as he starts to feel sick to his stomach. Jeff gets 15 consecutive life terms in prison. Glenda feels relief about the sentence. Lionel goes to Jeff and says he's been the one to blame all this time. He admits that he shouldn't have helped Jeff get the roadkill and dissect them. He apologizes not creating an open dialogue family environment for Jeff, then admits he's always had similar feelings of wanting to kill people and that it passed down to Jeff. He says he wasn't a good father because he wasn't a good husband and made a toxic home environment. Joyce writes a letter admitting her part in all of this. She admits failing Jeff and doesn't want her to feel guilty anymore. She opens her stove's gas pipes in order to kill herself. Fortunately, David Dahmer, the younger brother, was able to save Joyce in time. Meanwhile, Lionel is writing his book about everything that has transpired. The two cops who were suspended are then reinstated even after what they've done. Reverend Jackson is upset of the outcome but admits that they must continue fighting even if an appeal fails. At Columbia Correctional Facility in Portage, Wisconsin, Dahmer receives a bunch of letters. He jokes around with a guard about getting a razor blade and cyanide pills to unalive himself. One of the letters mentions that Dahmer is now a Halloween costume and that there's even a comic book about him. His fan gives him $5 and in return, he will get more money if he writes back. So he draws a dismembered hand for his fan. In the cafeteria, he mentions how his food looks like a human thumb, then begins to eat it in front of everyone. Christopher Scarver mentions how he doesn't like Jeffrey, but Jeff just shrugs it off. Later, Glenda is going back to live in her old apartment. Her daughter is annoyed that the apartment complex is just a circus show for the media. Before entering her apartment, Glenda looks afraid as she looks over at Jeff's room. Her daughter doesn't want Glenda to live in the apartment again because she can still smell death. However, Glenda refuses to let Jeffrey win. In the prison, Jeff receives a $20 bill. He uses this to get one of the guards to get him a tape of whale sounds to help him sleep. A different guard takes the tape from him because it sounds like people dying. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hughes receives fan mail asking for her signature on a Dahmer comic book. Shirley decides she wants to file a civil suit against the book, not for money, but because it's evil. The lawyer suggests they go after Lionel Dahmer for his new book, and go after any money the Dahmers may get for discussing the case. Shirley thinks going after the city and Jeff himself feels right, but going after Jeff's family seems wrong. At the end of their meeting, she decides to go after the Dahmer family. Lionel's book reviews are going good. Jeff watches his dad on TV discussing the new book. However, any profits made from the book will be going to all the victims' families. Meanwhile, the synthosome phone family are just having a regular family night, but they constantly receive calls about going back where they came from. One night, Sumsack is having a nightmare of being bound and Jeff is telling him to relax so he can take pictures. He sees his father scrubbing a boat with the room flooded. His dad says we got to get out of here. Some sack goes to the basement and sees his brother Connorisk about to be drilled by Jeff. Some sack screams then wakes up. He goes to the kitchen to find his mom cutting Connorisk out of the family photos. She says they no longer say his name. Then she sobs some more after seeing her son's photo. The two police officers who gave Connorisk back to Jeff, leading to Connorisk's eventual death, are given Milwaukee Police Officers of the Year award. He mentions how important it is to back the blue, especially when the public is against them. The crowd cheers for the two despicable officers. Concurrently, Glenda Cleveland is given a Citizens Award. She says that in the future, 
She hopes the police chief does better. The Synthosome phone family are going after the city for $10 million. The entire family then prays for Connorisk's spirit. Later, they receive a phone call complaining about the $10 million lawsuit and the family should go back to their rice fields. Back in Glenda's apartment, she dreams about hearing noises again. She goes downstairs to hang out with everyone. Apparently, anyone who is unable to sleep in their own apartments due to the trauma have a little hallway to sleep in. Glenda admits that Jeff has taken over her life and she's still traumatized by it all. The next morning, the apartment manager says they can't allow them to sleep in the hallway due to safety reasons. Glenda goes to Conorisk's funeral. She talks to the priest who mentions that they were never able to retrieve the entire body, but they have some parts of Conorisk. Conorisk's mom is hysterical as she stands over the casket. Glenda talks to the father who apologizes for trusting the police and allowing Conorisk to go back to Jeff. He said that it's okay because Glenda did all she could. Later, Lionel visits his mom in a nursing home. He says the movie is no longer happening. He says he only wanted parents to look for the red flags. One night, Glenda comes home to see men taking photos at Jeff's apartment complex. Glenda's daughter decides to smash the camera. She soon apologizes for her temper. While Jeff has a broadcasted interview on TV, the entire world watches in fascination. Jeff admits that he wanted to create zombies so that the victims wouldn't leave him. The TV explains how Conorisk's head was drilled open and Jeff poured acid into it. Glenda is pissed that Jeff is able to go on national TV and tell his story. She says this is not a Halloween story as the entire world watches this Netflix series near Halloween. The police then come knocking on her door and they arrest her daughter for assault since she broke the man's camera earlier. A man named Joseph Silva raised enough money to buy all of Doma's personal belongings, then asks to bury all of it. He didn't want Doma to gain more publicity through the auction and wanted the city to be free of the crimes. The lawyer dealing with Synthosome phone lawsuit for 10 million advises the family to take the settlement of $850,000. She said it is best to just move on from all of this. Later, Joseph goes to their house to give any remaining money from the money he raised to all the 11 victims' families. He gives $32,000 to Mr. Synthosome Phone. The family then receives another prank call demanding them to take the settlement of $850,000. Apparently, it was the cops who made this call. Ron Flowers is shown. He is one of the men that escaped Dahmer, thanks to Dahmer's grandma. He talks to a guy who says he no longer goes out anymore since he tested positive. Ron says he understands and relates to his situation, where he constantly sees Jeff where he goes. However, he doesn't let this fear keep him in the house. Ron tells him he has to face his fears. Later, the apartment manager tells Glenda that they have 60 days to move out because they're demolishing the building. Glenda thinks a memorial to honor the victims should be put in place. Eventually, the building is demolished and Glenda thinks she sees Jeff through one of the windows. In the prison during church service, everyone is singing and then a man stabs Jeff in the neck, saying he deserves it. Jeff survives this and gets a tour of letters later. A Venna creepy Christmas card. A letter tells Jeff that he's like Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers. He'll never die. It's 1977 in Chicago, Illinois. John brings a guy over to his house to work on some construction. The guy immediately smells something off as he walks past a clown painting. John says it might just be a dead raccoon. John gives him some Coca-Cola and immediately he feels off. John ties the man's hands with a rosary, then smashes his face with his hands. The man tries to fight back, but John pummels him with a pan. Then John grabs his belt to strangle him. The film transitions to John dressed up as a clown as he drowns the man in the bathtub. Back in the show's present day, Glenda watches the news reporter saying they're going to be executing John Wayne Gacy for his crimes. John murdered 33 young men. A co-worker says John is the worst, 
but Glenda says Jeff was worse than him. Then she comments about how she'll never be able to get the smell out of her nose. In the prison, Christopher Scarver stares at Jeff from afar. Chris watches Jeff pull pranks, sells his autograph, and gets special treatment. Eventually, Chris confronts Jeff about all the shit he's been doing because it doesn't align with his Christian values. Chris tells Jeff that he clearly has zero remorse for whatever it is he's done. Later, Chris asks to do research on Dahmer. The librarian allows him to read all the newspaper articles about Dahmer being a cannibal, then reads about Connorisk, the boy who was returned to Dahmer by the police. He's visibly upset and disgusted by all of this. Later, Jeff watches an interview of John Wayne Gacy who has found God. This inspires Jeff to seek the prison's priest. Jeff talks about how he once was the devil for Halloween and even made a shrine for the devil. Jeff talks about the differences between him and John, how Jeff wants to die and how he feels remorse for killing the victims. John doesn't feel any of this and still denies committing the murders. Lionel visits his son in prison. Jeff says he's taking Prozac now and misses alcohol. Lionel admits that his book didn't do so well. Then Jeff says he wants to get baptized. Lionel is happy about this. Jeff then asks for his father's forgiveness and Lionel says he does forgive him. Glenda attends one of the Synthosomephone's son's wedding. Mr. Synthosomephone admits that he still thinks about Dahmer even though he tries so hard to be happy. Meanwhile, the Hughes family sees the latest issue on the Dahmer comic books. It's titled Jesus vs. Dahmer. They want to file another lawsuit even though they lost the previous one. Shirley says even if they lose in court, it makes a statement. Then one of them jokes that they hope Jesus whoops Jeffrey's ass in the comics. The day John Wayne Gacy is executed is the same day Jeff gets baptized. And also there's a solar eclipse. John's last words is kiss my ass. Chris looks annoyed that Jeff is getting baptized. He screams in his cell while the film transitions between the execution and Jeff's baptism. Chris asks the Lord what he has to do while holding his rosary. A guard gets Dahmer, Jesse and Chris for their work duty. They clean the gym equipment but Jeff seems suspicious of the entire ordeal. Eventually Chris kills the other inmate. He say the guy killed his wife and tried to pin it on two black guys. Chris says it doesn't compare to what Dahmer did. He approaches Jeff and asks what made him want to do all those things. Jeff says he's a changed man thanks to God. Chris says his God is a God of vengeance and the Lord told Chris to punish Dahmer. He punches Jeff then grabs a weapon and hits Jeff repeatedly with it. While this happens, Jeff remembers all the things he's done. Chris then ends it all with a prayer. Amen. Lionel goes to the hospital and finds out that Jeff has passed. Joyce and Lionel split the remains of Dahma. During talks about the autopsy, Joyce makes a remark about how Lionel knows all about dissecting. Scientists want to use Dahmer's brain to study it. Lionel doesn't want the brain to be studied, but Joyce thinks it would benefit everyone. They go to court over this, and the judge rules to destroy the brain. Sometime later, Glenda goes to see how the POC memorial is doing, but it's still a vacant lot. Glenda is pissed that no one seems to care about the victims. By the end of the show, a POC or memorial has still not been built. That ends this series and hope you stay subscribed to the channel. We will be covering my psychopath movies and TV shows. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.